we may have a few more people come in. Let me just say, um, first off, thank you so much for being here. And we realize it's a busy time of the semester. There's senior shows going up or coming down, or uh, papers, lots of lots of papers to be written, and things to study for. I think I know almost everybody here, but if you don't know me, my name is Taylor Worley, and I um, teach for theology and missions. And it has been uh, my privilege and my responsibility over the last couple of years to supervise Trey's discipline-specific honors project. And I just hope they're all this much fun. And they're all this easy. <laughs> uh, it's been a real joy to work with Trey. And it's, it's been really rewarding to see the fruits of his labor and his exploration of this topic, uh, one that he cares quite a bit about. Um, what we're going to do today is, in just a couple moments, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us and for that time we have together. And then Trey's going to uh, offer a presentation, a multimedia presentation that we're excited about. And then... Uh, the panel, let me introduce the panel as well. Dr. Scott Hewlin and Dr. Randall Bush uh, have uh, agreed to help in this process of shepherding Trey through, um, through his project, but also helping uh, to evaluate his thesis. So that is uh, one of the objectives today. We, wanna, um, we want Trey to have a chance to defend publicly his thesis, but more than that, we, he wants the opportunity to share uh, the benefits of what he's learned and discovered, what he's um, what he's been thinking about uh, this time. So he's going to do that for a good bit of time, and then we're just going to have a conversation, a dialogue. We're going to ask some questions as his um, committee, his on his honors thesis committee, and then we're going to invite you guys to join in the conversation, ask questions, make comments, and we'll talk for a little bit. We should be done around 4:15. So that's what you're. That's what's in store. For you. Let me pray for us as we get started. Father God, we just want to pause in this moment to say, first of all, thank you. Thank you, God, for the, the gift of this community. I want to thank you for the gift of eager curious and voracious appetited students that want to know you and see you glorified in the world. We thank you for bringing us to this hour. Thank you for shepherding Trey to this point. In gratitude, we say thank you for this time together chance to benefit from what you've been teaching him and we want to learn along with him and join in that feast. Pray for clarity of thought and expression for a brother and in all things we pray that you be glorified in our community in this hour and in what remains of this semester. We ask all this for the glory of Christ Jesus. Much everyone for coming. It's uh, really overwhelming to see all of you here. This, this presentation is the, the result of, I'd say, about three years of lots of thought and lots of reading really thick books and uh, lots of writing really long papers um, and just a lot of conversation with you guys. It's really been the main thing that's driven forward a lot of my thinking. I I was talking to Taylor about my project the other day, and I don't know which one of us ended up saying this, but I think that I finally found the starting point. I don't think that I've come to the answers or that I've figured out you know, what's going on, and my goal is not to put a bow on all the conversations we've had and say, here it is, I figured it out. Um, I, I think that what has resulted from the last three years of lots of thinking research and writing and trying to articulate um, these ideas is I've kind of found a starting point for how to approach thinking about art and why it matters. And so this really is a Trey Talks About Art and Why It Matters kind of thing. Um, what's going on. There's, there's way too much um, 
to try to pack into 45 minutes. I even after I made the presentation, there's just there's too much in this presentation for 45 minutes. So um, those of you who are in contemporaneous of art history, I'm going to try not to talk as fast as I did in the Damon Hirst presentation. <laughs> I'm going to try not to say we'll get to this later and never get to it as much as I did in that presentation. Um, but I will be skipping over some things, um, and if some of that one needs to come up in, in the Q&A time, you can. But I'm just going to try to hit the high points of this presentation and a, a framework for, for how to think about art, uh, a framework for how to think about what art does. Um, so I want to start out with some nice little props. Um, this is my senior thesis right here. It is double-sided, so it's a little misleading. Thanks for the applause. It's, it's good. Uh, this is, so this is a technical philosophy paper. This is Rebecca Edgreen's senior thesis. Um, this is a collection of short stories, of which I've only read a couple because she won't let me read the rest, but hopefully one day I'll get to it. Um, and so this is a, a collection of short stories. And then over here behind me, we have this beautiful painting by Betsy Marsh, which is part of her senior project. Um, and so my question is, these are three works by three students, and obviously we're different, but I think we're like-minded in some ways. So what's different about these, about these different artifacts? Um, what's, what's different about them? Do they do they mean in the same way, do they have the same kind of meaning? When I approach them, when I sit down and read them, do I read them the same way? Obviously, I'm not reading this at all. I'm looking at it, right? Um, so what's the, what's the difference um, in how all of these things work? Um, and I'm going to propose that this is my, kind of the, the framework for how I started to think about this, that there's three different kinds of, of discourse. So discourse just means an exchange or communication. Um, so I'm going to say there's philosophic discourse, and then there's aesthetic discourse, um, and then the last one would be narrative discourse. And while there's similarities and there's bleed between all three of these, I think that they all function in their own distinct ways. And they have to be approached in distinct ways if they're going to be meaningful. Um, so my experience starts with, or my, my project starts with the experience of being stopped by a painting. Um, and my sophomore year, summer after my sophomore year, went to New York with my family, we went to the Met, and I saw this painting, a Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm, for the first time in person. I'd seen images before, hadn't really been interested, and then I walked around the corner and there it was, and it just stopped me, um, dead in my tracks, and stopped and stared at it for a long time. My dad kept texting me about weapons exhibits and stuff. <laughs> I wasn't interested, I was right in front of this painting, this is what I, I was looking at. And, but I didn't understand that experience, and I couldn't understand how it was meaningful or what kind of meaning I was getting out of it. I didn't, I didn't know how to process what I was, what was happening to me in my experience with this painting. Um, and then that next semester, I really started digging heavy into Paul Ricoeur, who is a French hermeneutic philosopher. Started working in the 20s and 30s and died in about 2000 and, um, 2008, I think, is when he died. And uh, so he spans a long time um, of his work. Um, but in, what I was most interested in was his, his hermeneutic philosophy, his, his theory of how narrative fiction works. Um, and his big question was, how is it possible for fiction, which is necessarily not true stories, how is it possible for fiction to be meaningful and to tell truth? Um, that was his big concern. Um, and so. As I was reading this work, I, I could sense that there was, a, there was some kind of connection to my experience with paintings, um, to my experience with how paintings could be meaningful in a way very different from how the philosophy books I was reading were meaningful. Um, and so I'm going to spend some time trying to explain Ricoeur's theory of text. And it may seem like an unrelated thing to talk about text when I'm supposed to be talking about art. Um, but I think it's important for me to talk um, first in, in Ricoeur's terms before I can reappropriate some of what Ricoeur did and try to, to see how it can apply to, to visual art as well. So, Ricoeur, like I said, um, did a lot with fiction. Um, and where he, he begins is with the, the idea of metaphor. Um, that how is it possible for, for metaphors to mean, and do they mean in the same way as direct speech? Um, the same thing that I began with, you know, do these three different things mean in the same way? Uh, for a long time, Classical rhetoric had treated metaphor as just a strategy of just just a, a nice thing to make writing look pretty. You know, it's just the same as personification or imagery. Metaphor is just one more thing that you can do to make, to enhance the writing and make it more pleasing. Um, but Ricoeur sensed that there's something more going on. 
um, there's something different happening. Um, there's something more to metaphor than just a strategy of discourse. And, and he wanted to open it up, um, to expand it to be capable of more meaning. Um, and what he ends up seeing is that there's what he, what I'll go ahead and call direct discourse. Um, and then on the other hand, there's what he calls metaphoric discourse. Um, and we'll get to some of the correlations on this chart that's taking place here. But for now, just stick with his distinction between direct and metaphoric discourse. So he's going to say that there's two ways of trying to say something. You can, you can say it directly, um, and you can try to get past the language, past the words, and get to the ideas. You, you, it's like a, the words function is like a container in a way. You have an idea, and you put it in the container, and you push it across the table, and then the reader unpacks it, and they'll they have the idea. That's what direct discourse tries to do. Metaphor doesn't seem to work in the same way. Um, something's different about the way it works. There's that famous Emily Dickinson poem that says, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Um, that when, you, when I say, for instance, this is an example where Kerr uses, man is a wolf. I, I obviously don't mean that a man is a wolf. That, that, that doesn't make sense that on, that, on that first level. Um, and so how then does it, can it be a meaningful statement to say man is wolf? What can be meaningful about that? Where Kerr says metaphoric discourse is the answer. And th there's two um, key things. If metaphor is not a container, um, there, there's two results. The first thing is, is what Ricoeur calls split reference. Um, and this, this is what I was saying with man is a wolf. The reader or the hearer has to recognize when the person says man is a wolf, they don't mean man is literally a wolf. The, the literal reference, the literal meaning has to be erased. And there's a split reference that shows up, what Ricoeur calls mythic reference at one point. Um, and it functions in its own terms. And so when you're thinking, when someone says man is a wolf, that's not just a container for some idea about lonely, like man is lonely or man is, is savage or anything like that. There's, there's a lot more going on than just one direct idea that's put in this container of a metaphor and put across. And, and it's what I call the opacity of metaphor. Mercury uses this term in the symbolism of people. Um, and so the opacity of metaphor means that it, the attention of the reader, the hearer, in approaching this metaphor is on the metaphor itself. It's on the play of the language itself. So when you think about man as a wolf, you have to think about what is a wolf, and you have to think about the things associated with a wolf. You can't just get straight through it into some kind of meaning. You have to dwell there. And I call it opacity because you can't just see straight through it. You have to look at it, and you have to pay close attention to the metaphor itself. The second thing that Ricoeur wants to highlight about metaphor is what he calls semantic innovation. Um, and elsewhere he uses the term, the, he says that metaphor creates resemblance. And, and what's going on here is that metaphor is not just illustration or decoration. Um, another way of saying this is that metaphor is not something that once you get the meaning, you can then discard. Um, so, for instance, when I say man is a wolf, and then if I want to talk about loneliness or man being savage, I can't just forget about um, the metaphor, because the metaphor is more than just one of those meanings. So I call this the irreducibility, which is kind of a mouthful, um, but the irreducibility of metaphor, which means that it's more than its interpretations. Um, metaphor is more than its interpretations. And what a metaphor does is it adds new meaning that was otherwise unavailable in language. If all I meant to say is that man can be savage, I don't need to say man is a wolf. Um, but if somehow there's this, there's this correlation, and something happens, and I see this, this resemblance, it, when it's saying it's a wolf, there's a new meaning in that than is otherwise unavailable in language, in direct language. So what metaphor discourse does is it opens up. Direct discourse likes to constrict and to name and to place, and metaphor discourse opens up. So these two things, the opacity and the irreducibility of metaphor, I'll come back to you later. Really, we'll do that. <laughs> um, in his next book, um, it's not the directly following book, but kind of in the middle of what I call his hermeneutic turn. In this book, interpretation theory, and one of the main things he does here is try to establish that metaphor works um, according not as a strategy of discourse, like I said, it's not a rhetorical device, but it's a it's a mode of discourse in itself. Um, but he does something even bigger there, and he says that the way that fiction can meet. The way that stories can have truth value 
is that they function according to a different mode of discourse. So they have to be judged by a different standard, they have to be approached in a different way. You just read them different. You read fiction differently than you read a philosophy paper. Um, if you try to read fiction like a philosophy paper, it's all going to not be true. It's going to be lies because fiction is a not true story, right? And so it has to be approached in a completely different way. The next thing I want to talk about is, is time and data. So this is probably his most technical book in his hermeneutic term. Um, and this is going to be the most technical part of the presentation. But I think it's important to, to get some of these terms out there. And this is the heart of Ricoeur's theory of fiction. Mimesis refers, is a Greek word that refers to the act of making, like the creative act. Um, and the reason why it's left untranslated is because people use it differently and translate it differently based on how they think about art. So Plato uses the term to mean imitation. Um, Plato thinks that art is just a cheap copy, whether it be poetry or drama or painting. He thinks it's just a cheap copy of the original. Um, Aristotle uses the term, or uses it in the sense of representation, then re-presentation. So there's kind of a sense of doing it again, of reenacting it. Um, but Ricoeur wants to be more specific. He wants to be more technical. And I think this is one of the instances where philosophy being technical can be very helpful. Uh, Ricoeur is very precise, and he says that mimesis actually has three movements. Um, you can't use just one word to translate it. You have these three different parts of mimesis, and it has to pass through all three of them before it's complete. Uh, mimesis is not just one thing. It, ha it has to have all three of these. So the first of these is, is what he calls prefiguration. Uh, prefiguration refers to the inspiration of the author. It's when the author sees something, gets a story in their head, gets something that, that is the creative impulse. Um, your poets a lot of times, or even in Ellen's presentation where she talked about seeing the red on that hill, uh, for those of you who were at, at Ellen's um, senior show. And there's something that she, that she sees, that the author sees something. Um, and this is the, the prefiguration. Um, a lot of writers talk about it differently. Some, some people have kind of the whole thing laid out before they start writing. Um, some people have one character. Some people start with a sentence. But there's something that they, some vague sense of where they're going, of what they're trying to do. Um, the next thing is, is what's called, what Ricoeur calls configuration. Um, and this is, this is the inscription of the text. This is when the, the writer has that idea and starts writing. Once there's words on the page, they mean something regardless of what the author intended them to mean. They have a meaning. If I write, I hate cats, and I, what I meant to say was I love cats, it doesn't matter. What I wrote says I hate cats. And so there's, there's an autonomy of the text. The text has a life of its own, and it has a meaning of its own. And so what happens in the movement between prefiguration and configuration, um, the, the, that's what the process of writing is, is there's this weird cooperation between the writer and the text itself to try to figure out what it's going to become. Um, and then on the next side of the movement, from configuration to refiguration, is the process of reading, in which when, when you read um, a story, not everything is given to you. You have to, you have to bring it to life. When you're reading a story, you have to fill in the gaps sometimes. You have to imagine it. You have to, you have to bring it into its existence. But what happens when you read a story, this is so true in fantasy, but I think it's true in all of, all of literature, is that there's a world. There's a totally different world. This You can call the world of the text, um, which is the, the, the language that Ricoeur uses. And what happens in refiguration, this is the final moment, is that in refiguration, the reader is transformed. The way that the reader looks at his own or her own world is transformed by their encounter with the world of the text. So that the reader has a way that they look at the world, that they live in the world. And they come to this text, and they can imaginatively inhabit the world of the text as they read. And then in refiguration, they walk away transformed. They walk away, and the world is different. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Gilead by Mary Robinson, but there's an amazing passage in there about sprinklers. And I've never looked at sprinklers the same way after reading them. Um, sprinklers have forever changed for me, and they're forever filled with meaning. Um, so there's a couple of implications of this, important implications of this. Uh, the first is what I said, the, the autonomy of the text. Uh, the text has a life of its own, it has a mind of its own, once it's out there, once it's written. It's got a life of its own. And what this means, one of the, the biggest implications, is that the text, in the process of reading, is the active agent. The text 
is what does work on the reader. So a, a lot of, some theories of literature like to talk about how the reader has to activate the text, the reader has to put in the text, and Ricoeur acknowledges there's some truth to this, but fundamentally what's happening in the process of reading is the text is doing something to you. Um, and this is why a lot of um, cultural critics, especially Christian conservatives, are really kind of scared of movies and literature, because they recognize there's this power of literature to do something to you, to change the way you look at the world, to change the way you think, to change the way you feel. Um, and they're, they're scared of that. But what they're acknowledging is that the text is the active agent um, in the process of reading. The other implication is that metaphor happens as a merging of horizons. This is language that Recur borrows from a guy named Hans George Gadamer. Um, and and the, the image here is you have these two worlds, and the horizons start to merge in the act of reading. And what happens is there's a rubbing off. There's a rubbing off of the world of the text onto the world of the reader. And there's this, um, that Ricoeur uses the own points language of, of sedimentation, of, of the, the, these, these layers of meaning that kind of fall off, like the way that dirt like, um, gets on, on a riverbank. You know, there's this it, deposits of meaning that are left behind. He also uses the, the idea of traces or residue of meaning that's left behind from the world of the text and the world of the reader. And, and Ricoeur has this interesting statement, and, and he uses poetry here uh, to be to, to talk about metaphoric discourse in general. He uses them interchangeably sometimes. But he says, it's not the function of poetry to establish another world, um, another world that corresponds to other possibilities of existence, to possibilities that would be most deeply our own. What's interesting to me about this um, quote is the language of potential that he uses. Um, the language of, of potential which grounds the act of reading and grounds metaphoric um, discourse in imagination, um, in the ability to imaginatively inhabit another world, um, and then to somehow that gets reapplied to our own idea of how the world could be, of maybe how the world is. So in the application to painting, to return um, to our original topic, it's, uh, it's, not, it's kind of complicated. Um, Early on, I tried to just say, okay, well, this stuff makes a lot of sense, and intuitively it makes sense of painting, so let's just call paintings texts. And let me turn around and see how I can read this painting as a text. Um, I realized that that doesn't make sense of how art works at all. Um, <laughs> painted, but that's not a text, right? You don't read it. It's different. Something different's going on. Um, so, it's, the painting's not a text, and you're all familiar maybe with this painting by René Magritte, Treasury Images. Even this painting that has text in it says this is not a pipe. I don't know that because I read French. I just know I've seen it translated. Um, if you were just to read this, if I were just to put this up on the screen by itself, the words this is not a pipe, you would, first of all, it would be out of context, but you would have to imagine a pipe or something. But in this case, there's a painting you can try to make. You're looking at the image. When you read a narrative text, you're having to construct it in your mind. Maybe there's illustrations, but then you turn the page from the illustration and you're on the next page and it's just text and you have to imagine what's going on in your mind. With, it, with a painting, it's there, it's given to you. Um, so there's something that you're still, you're not, you don't read this painting. You do have to be part of it, but you still view, you look at this painting, there's something different going on. So what about painting as uh, a story? Um, uh, Hillary had an as a amazing senior show, uh, the book Luca is so good. Um, sorry, well, Jimmy Fallon I was there. Um, I'm not going to do it, I'll let Taylor imagine it instead. Uh, so, one of the problems with, um, with trying to apply to occur is not a lot of paintings are, are narrative. You know? a, a lot of them are just these static images, like a Mark Rothko. Like, what's the narrative about a Mark Rothko? Right? Um, and, what does, and so, for a long time, I thought, okay, one of the things that's different is that paintings are never narrative. Well, that's not really true, because in, in Hillary, she's using pictures to tell a story. Um, she's using pictures to. to do a narrative, to do the same thing that a narrative text would do. But she made an interesting comment at her senior show um, that this storybook, that the benefit of not having words is that it forces the readers to supply their own story. Right? So it's doing something different than what a narrative text is doing. A narrative text is giving you the story and letting you supply the images. But something like Hillary's work, you can see the progress here. You know, there's, there's the black sky, he's starting to the stars, and then in this one, there's stars, right? So there's there's obviously a narrative element. There's something going on with time here. Um, 
but it's, it's a different process than how reading a narrative text works. Um, also, each of these individually is an amazing image that works the way the images work, not the way the text work. Even if you read the book as a whole, you still look at the images. You don't read the images, right? You, you, don't, you can't read this. You, you, you have to look at it, and it, it means in a different way. Um, so this leads to, I think, the, the key distinction between narrative and, um, and, this, and painting, which I don't know if you can see this yet, but I have to draw this distinction between narrative discourse and aesthetic discourse. Um, where I, I think the painting functions by, by what I do call aesthetic discourse. The difference is, is time. Um, narratives have to unfold over time. You can't say a narrative in one second. You can't say it in an instant. It has to unfold over time. Paintings, at least in theory, can be looked at a glance. This really crazy Corona Spash painting that I hate looking at um, <laughs> is... There's lots of parts. You obviously can't take it all in at once. And you do have to stare at it over time to see all the different parts. But there's not a built-in temporality to this. You, you can see it in one glance. You have to maybe zoom in and out of different parts as you look at it. But there it is. It's static. It's there in one glance. So that, that, that's, I think, what the, the key distinction is um, between narrative and aesthetic discourse. So what's the comment then? If I said that Recur, I spent all this time saying that Recur was going to apply, and now I just told you all the reasons why Recur can't apply um, directly. And, and I think what it is, is that they function in the same category of metaphor discourse. Jamie Smith is a philosopher and theologian in Calvin College. He wrote a book called Imagining the Kingdom, which is a sequel to a book called Desiring the Kingdom. But he, he works with Recur and interprets this, this, this link in Recur's thought of of metaphor and imagination. Um, that what's in common between both painting and, and narrative is they function according to, to imagination, according to, to metaphor. And, and I, I think that the, the saying that painting is, is metaphor is fairly clear um, from, the, from the way I defined it earlier, from the way Recur understands metaphor, it's fairly clear. So first of all, I talked about opacity, right? Um, metaphors don't function as containers. You have to take them on their own terms. Um, this is abundantly clear in a painting. This painting is certainly an image, and it's, a, it's amazingly done. It, it, it's so incredible. But when you get up close to it, from right here, I can see these brush strokes. I can see the paint on the canvas. This refuses to, to be just a window. Right, and if I thought that it was just a window that Elisa was standing behind this painting and started trying to talk to her or something, I'm not getting the meaning of the painting, right? Like to understand the meaning of this painting, I have to recognize these brush strokes. I have to recognize the opacity, the physicality of the painting. And no matter how perfect it may be, no painting is genuinely a window to the world. Linear perspective makes it seem as if it's a window to the world. But no painting ever functions actually as a window. It's a painting. It's, it's marks on a flat surface, um, fundamentally. And then also the irreducibility. Um, paintings just give you more than you can say. You can, you can talk about a painting all you want, and you can keep talking about it, but they're inexhaustible. Um, they refuse to be pinned down into just one thing. This is a really great example. It's by a painter named William Kenridge. I, I don't know that I can tell you words of what this painting is or does. Um, I've looked at it a lot and it's really, I think it captures the human condition really well, the modern condition really well. But I, I, can't, I can't pin it down. I can't get it into just one thing. Paintings do more. They open up. Right? I said the metaphor works by opening up rather than by constricting. This painting opens up a whole new way of looking at things. And there's one final thing that Ricoeur says about metaphor and also about painting. In a, there's one or two interviews where he actually talks about visual art. And he talks about its singularity. And this is true, I think we have a, I had for a long time had a, a wrong understanding of how metaphor worked. I thought of metaphor as a container, right? And, and finally this idea of singularity became really important and opened up my eyes to see how metaphor functions. Metaphor functions by digging in deep into a, a singular specific problem, right? Poetry or, or narrative or paintings that are trying to be 
broad and try to do these big abstract things, they end up falling flat. But works of art that can get in and dig specific, those are the ones that really do something. And Cezanne was famous for painting this mountain so many times. I think it was hundreds of times he painted this mountain. People won't ask, like, why, do you, why does he keep painting this same mountain over and over and over again? Um, and Recur comments that it is, and he, he cites Van Gogh in this example too. He says, it is as if the artist experiences the urgency of an unpaid debt with respect to something that had to be said in a singular manner. And so, so what happens in both metaphor, and I think this is abundant, like more than abundantly clear in painting, is that there's a singularity to it. This painting is, is this particular view of this painting and nothing else. Um, this is what I think is amazing about Impressionism. Impressionism tries to capture that moment that you see the sun come on the water, right? Um, Monet's Impression Sunrise. Just that, that one moment, it's a specific singular thing that he tries to capture so hard. Uh, and, okay, so, that was a cool transition. <laughs> the question then um, is how this then applies to the singularity. What kind of singularity is it? And what, what, I, what I try to map into Ricoeur's scheme of things is Aristotle's modes of discourse. And so the three, well, he calls them actually modes of persuasion. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Maybe you're familiar with them. Logos refers to rational argument or ideas. Pathos usually refers to feeling or attitude, and ethos refers to generally the moral character or authority of the speaker. And I argue that there's a link between narrative and ethos. When you put down, or let's say, let's take the film, when you finish watching um, No Country for Old Men, for those of you who have seen it, there's this sense of, the response to it is a, a dis dissatisfaction with the ending, right? It, it doesn't, it doesn't morally satisfy. I mean, I think that the movie is, is paradigmatic of, of every story. I think that every story we either respond to by saying that was satisfying or that wasn't satisfying. Um, and so like Disney movies, a lot of people love Disney movies because they work out the way things are supposed to work out. And a lot of people hate Disney movies for the same reason. Because they say, that was cheap. That didn't do anything for me. That doesn't reflect what's going on. That, that, that didn't seem like justice to me. That didn't seem like that's how that was actually supposed to happen. Um, and, and so while I don't think that good stories end with the good guy killing the bad guy and giving the girl, uh, stories always give us an ethical vision of the world. They either say, this is how the world is and it's wrong, or they say, this is how the world should be and this is right. They, they affect us in, a, in an ethical way. <coughs> I wish that I had more time to talk about that, um, but I don't. Um, so just we can talk about that more later. Um, <coughs> air, aesthetic and, and pathos, um, I think that connection is immediately makes sense, right? Feeling and art have for a long time been associated together. But art seems like it's more than feeling. I think there's more than an emotional experience happening when I stand before Jackson Pollock's painting. I, there is a, definitely an emotional experience, but there's something more than that. There's something bigger than just feelings. Because if I should just, I don't experience a painting as, oh, that makes me happy, oh, that makes me sad, and that's it. Certainly that's present, but when I'm meaningfully impacted by a painting, it seems bigger to me than my own emotions. It seems bigger to me than my own taste. And so the question then that I had is, then how does this work? What's this correlation of, of pathos and aesthetic um, dimension? And this is where I have one more thing to map into this one more triad that I think is an interesting correlation. And these are what Recur at one point calls the three great transcendentals. There's the true, the beautiful, and the just. Sorry for my atrocious handwriting. The spelling. Did I misspell beautiful? <laughs> yeah. I think I've done that before. The connection between truth and logos and philosophy seems pretty clear. Philosophy generally is trying to figure out what's true. Right? But the connection between narrative and ethos and justice, I tried to touch on a little bit. That the, the vision of a world that, that narrative gives us is an ethical vision of the world. 
So then to say that the aesthetic and the pathos relate to beauty. Beauty is a big word. Uh, it's dangerous to throw around with capital B. That's why I put them in all caps so I wouldn't have to decide if I wanted to capitalize it. <laughs> so what, what's, the, uh, what's the correlation here? Just like I said with narrative, I'm not saying that good art is conforms to some external standard of beauty. Um, what I am saying is that what, what, what paintings do to us is they change our understanding of what is beauty. This is a painting by um, Van Gogh. It's in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And it's kind of a dingy little painting. It's just about this big. It's darker than this. Um, but it's, it's amazing. It's so striking. And it's just a pair of shoes. Like, it's just a pair of peasants' work boots. And you walk up to it, and it's beautiful. And I think, I think that this painting is why there's so many Instagrams of people's boots. Like, I think there's a reason for it, right? I think it's because paintings like this teach us to see something as simple as a pair of shoes as beautiful. They teach us to see beauty where we had missed it. And sometimes, sometimes modern art tries to, tries to hold the mirror and say, y'all, this world's ugly. Francis Bacon's paintings, I don't know if y'all are familiar with them, but there's, I mean, there's a, a screaming face and there's this raw meat on either side and it's dark and it's gringy. Gringy? Is that a weird word? <laughs> <laughs> And it's not, it's not beautiful in the sense that you look at it and go, oh, that's just a beautiful painting. But what it says, what he's saying is, this world is terrible. This world is ugly. Um, and he's, he's holding up a mirror and saying, this is what the world is. That's still, he's relating to beauty. He, he's, he's changing our idea of, of beauty. He's, he's relating to our concept of the beautiful. So some implications. Let's see, I have 15 minutes? How many times have I 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. I have 10 minutes left. I want to get to some implications or applications. I wrote applications on here and implications on there, so we'll go with implications um, of work. And those of you who are on Facebook and saw the event, I said that I had three audiences in mind for this talk. The first is those of you who are art students and practicing artists and want to make art. Y'all are the reason why I started thinking about a lot of this in the first place, and y'all are the reason why I've read so many books and written so many papers and thought for most of my waking hours about art. It's for y'all. Um, so that's a big point of why I'm here. Another group of people that I want to talk to is people like me who don't make art, but want to know how to respond appropriately, want to know what's the role of art, how am I supposed to approach it. And I'm not actually going to get to that right now. We can talk about that in discussion if y'all want. Um, but then the third group of people I've said I wanted to talk to is is those that move for, fall more in the, the apathetic category, people that don't really get why it's important and say, that's good for you that you like art, but it's not for me. Uh, and so I want to start there just briefly um, before moving over to, to, to talk to those of you who are artists. Looking at paintings requires learning how to look. When I was in high school, I didn't care at all about visual art. Um, I didn't. I wouldn't say that I cared about art at all, really. I loved stories, I loved music, but I thought that I liked them because of their philosophical ideas and theological ideas. I thought that's what I liked about them. I thought that's what moved me about them. And I was the last person that would want to go to a museum, and I was the last person to care about drinking good tea in a good ceramic mug. You know, I was, I was the last person to be thinking in those terms. So I'm not, you can't say to me if you say, oh, art's just not for me, it's for you. It wasn't always for me. It's something that I had to learn. It was a lot of conversations, a lot of standing in front of paintings or listening to songs that I didn't understand and trying to figure out how I was supposed to understand them. Um, so it's, it's something that takes learning. And I said earlier about Van, the Van Gogh painting that those paintings teach us to see beauty where we miss them. And they teach us to see beauty in the world. And I think they do something even more than that. Um, there's a, a philosopher named Maurice Marleau-Ponty um, that talks about the painting and, and some other things like that. And I, I didn't bring him in because he's really technical. Um, but one of the things that, that he gets at is that paint, paintings teach us to see the world as meaningful. When I look at this Van Gogh, it teaches me to see meaning in a pair of boots. Right? Not just beauty. But me. So whenever, when I'm sitting on my couch, about to go to work, and I'm lacing up my work boots, that, that experience becomes meaningful. 
it's not just the work a day, just putting on my boots and going to work. It, it inserts meaning into my life where it hadn't been present before. And that's what paintings do. And I think that it's like this experience here of Virgil and Dante. This is a famous painting um, by Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot. I think I said his name right, it's a long name. And it's a painting of, it's an illustration, I guess, from, from Dante's um, comedy, my comedy, and there's it's a picture of, of Virgil guiding um, Dante. And you see here, it's kind of blurry, sorry, but Dante's on the left, and he's worried about the leopards. He's worried about the basic facts of life, about existence. He's worried about not dying. Virgil wants to show him something more. Virgil wants to point him somewhere else. Um, and, and what he ends up pointing him to by the end of the Divine Comedy is this beatific vision of, of God, um, of, of ultimate reality, higher reality. He wants to take him away from these concerns of just getting by, of existing, of not dying, and point him to something more meaningful. And there's this quote from Jean-Luc Marion in this book, The Crossing of the Visible, that I really love because it's partly poetry and partly philosophy. I mean, it's actually a philosophy book, but they're just amazing lines. Um, but he says, if we entrust our eye to the eye of a painter, as though one were following in the footsteps of a guide, this would thus only be in order to see something other than what is visible to us. And what he's saying here is that the reason why we need artists and the reason why we need art is because they see things that we don't, that we miss. And we need a guide to show us to see meaning where we had missed it, to see beauty where we had missed it. Um, we are, I as an individual am just one person, and I'm so limited, so constricted in my view of the world, and I need others to come alongside. Um, and also, if you want to stick me in the category of philosopher, which I kind of might come out about, but for example, let's say I'm a philosopher, right? If I'm only reading philosophy, there's all of this other meaning that's not accessible to me. But the world is not just Logos, the word is not just idea. There's more to the world. There's more going on, and I need those other people. I need that other perspective. I need those guides to guide me along the way through a really dangerous journey in the divine comedy through hell and purgatory before he gets to heaven. It's a really dangerous journey, and we would never have made it without Virgil. I think we are in the same condition um, in relation to art. Some interesting things here from, from Dan Sedell and from Dr. Pulin about criticism. Just briefly, I'll say criticism, um, and, and by criticism I mean verbal responses to art, um, should function as opening space. This is Dan Sedell's big point. I'm talking about art should open up space for the artwork to do something, to do the same thing to other people that it did to me. It's not a matter of trying to pin it down to one thing or cast value judgments or whatever. It's, a, it's an attempt to open up space. Um, Dr. Hewlin has an, an essay on, I don't know why I said that, um, on, on hermeneutics and peregrination and hospitality, and, in which he talks about interpretation and in the, in the experience of reading a text as an, an encounter of hospitality between the text and the reader. I mean, I think what this leads to eventually is a conception of criticism, of talking about art as an act of gratitude. For me to write about a piece of art is for me to show my gratitude for the provision that I received from it, for the meaning that I received from it. We'll come back to that. So, a word to artists. There are three main implications that I want to draw from Ricoeur's theory of metaphor. Um, and there's a few final comments that I want to make. The first is, because metaphor is not a container, because your paintings are, or, or whatever, work you make is not a container for meanings, don't try to make containers. Don't, don't feel like you have to get this big philosophical idea and figure it all out in the world of ideas and then find a way to like somehow make a piece of art that when you talk about it, it's like, oh, okay, I can kind of see that. that that's not, your, your goal is not to make a container for an idea. You have liberty, you have freedom to pursue your medium. Um, pursue, um, like, a, when, when, a, when a potter sits down at the wheel, obviously they have a, a form in mind sometimes, right? And they, they have an idea of what they want to go with it. But the clay does things. And I know this is not because I'm a potter, but because I've talked to us, the clay just does things. And sometimes the clay ruins, you know, the, the pot falls apart. Um, but sometimes the clay gives you a pot that's more beautiful than what you had in mind. 
It's a better form than you were imagining. And, and all of the mediums are like that. Um, Nancy Dell recounted a, a story of talking to um, one of the artists that he worked with a lot, who said, once I put my brush on the canvas, I enter into, into a cooperative relationship with this thing. We're, we're in it together, and we got to figure out what I've messed up and how to fix it. And, and so you have, you have the freedom to think aesthetically. You don't have to think <laughs> philosophically and then try to somehow plug that into an aesthetic formula. You have the freedom to think aesthetically because that's what you do. The reason why you spend so many hours pulling all-nighters and staying up really late and carrying heavy rocks around is because, <laughs> is because that's how you process, that's how you think. And you get to meanings that way that I can never get to writing a philosophy paper. I could never get to thinking about it. And you get to then thinking, in a sense, through your work. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is there's freedom there. Um, don't try, don't let philosophy tell you. Don't let art critics tell you that you have to have a meaning first and then go into your work and it's got to come out exactly like you planned it. You have freedom to, to be an artist and to, to process in that way. The second thing I already talked about. So, <laughs> the third thing, um, in light of refiguration, in light of the fact that paintings can change people's worlds, there's a charge to be careful how you see and be careful how you paint. Because the work that you make has the power to change people. And it can change them for good or ill. Um, there's a heavy responsibility there. Your calling is not a light one. Um, your calling is not um, just entertainment or just distraction. Your calling is a very heavy calling. And it, it changes the way that people see the world. This image is a, a still from, from Ellen's senior show. And one of the things that really stuck out to me when she was talking about the piece in, in the statement was the way that she said, like I mentioned earlier, when she saw that hill um, in a new way that she'd never seen before, her response immediately was to go and get some of the dirt. Then she went back later and she dug in the dirt and, and felt it in her hands and worked with the dirt. And John Martin asked at one point, that the painter, like the blind man, sees more than the visible. I think it's really interesting to compare painters and blind people because we think of painting as such a visual thing. But his point here is that painters don't see what is visible, they see what's invisible. And they have the ability to make that invisible, that unseen thing, in some way, to have the ability to make it visible to the rest of us. In the end of Ellen's artist statement, she said, this is just a little tiny piece. This isn't anything close to what I experienced. Um, but it was a part of it. And while, while I'll never be able to see the meaning that, that she feels from the dirt, because of her work, I can experience some of it. And, and dirt, <laughs> that red clay does have new meaning for me than it did before. And, and this is what I think makes somebody an artist. It's two things. One is if you just see things that we notice. Um, Jean-Luc Marion has this amazing part where he says that the, the painter allows his gaze to wander in obscurity on this side of the visible, slipping under the line of visibility, positioned just under the watermark of the visible. That, the, and he says uh, in a higher place, the painter grants visibility to the unseen. The, if you want to be a practicing artist and, and you've devoted your life to it and you're willing to make those commitments, probably why you do that is because you just see things that you don't. And we need you to show us those things. And we need you um, to dig into those things. There's one more, I'm on time, but I'm back in two more minutes. There's one more correlation that I want to map on here that I think was the most interesting one for me. And it's this correlation here. The three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. New York artist Makoto Fujimura said in an interview once that the role of the Christian artist is to find the vocabulary of hope in the midst of the brokenness of the world. I think this is a really great example of, of doing that. And this is a painting by Ali Minan. And there's a lot of backstory to it that I think is really helpful and it makes the painting a lot more meaningful to me, but I think the painting, the stanzas itself, this, this car door, as you can maybe see, it's been shown on the side and painted. And it's a dark painting, it's a heavy painting. Physically, it's heavy, the plaster on the bottom weighs it down, and there's, 
there's kind of a tip for escape with the, the blue marks that are coming up, but there's this black wash on the top that, that's, that's forcing this painting down. This is, this is a heavy painting. It's, a, it's a, always a dark painting. I don't know if you can see it from right there, but right here, creeping out of the edges of this broken window where there's still some shards of glass, creeping out, there's, there's the, the hint of green. Um, and I think that's a moment of hope in the midst of brokenness. That's a moment of beauty, seeing beauty where we had missed it. Uh, Dostoevsky famously said that beauty will save the world. And I don't know if that's true universally, but it's certainly true in my experience. And so to those of you who are artists, who, who desire to be artists, I say that it's, it's, it's your work that in a lot of ways has saved me. questions from, from the audience. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Kula ask the first question. I'm going to have uh, So ditto, right, what you said about great work both on the pieces and on the presentation. Um, the, the one lingering question I have, and I think you've done such a fabulous job on the whole thing, but here's the lingering question that I have, and I want to hear you think out loud about it, because I'm sure you've thought about it. I just want to know what you're talking about. Is uh, when you bring in the, the three modes of persuasion from Aristotle, yeah. um, there's something slightly jarring about that because the fact that ostensibly three modes of persuasion um, might be said to all belong to the philosophic category, right? Because it's three different ways of going about the philosophic aim, right? Of, ex of explaining and uh, clarifying ideas and that sort of thing. So I wonder. Um, so there, there seems, at, at first blush anyway, there seems to be something inappropriate about taking these three items that are perhaps all belong to the philosophic thing and then uh, tracing, and then, and then uh, attaching them to, to three different modes of discourse. So I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. What's the, what's the warrant for doing that? Yeah. There's a fundamental disconnect with the, this chart that I have. And I haven't drawn lines kind of for a reason. And it's because None of these are completely straight categories. And in theory, we can talk about these different correlations. But any actual instance of discourse, any actual painting, any actual philosophy paper, like I said about this book, I think it's great poetry, but it's a philosophy book, right? There's, there's an impurity to the discourse. They, they cross over with one another. And if I can use, talk about painting to, to illustrate this, Miley's painting comes out of the story of her own life, her own biography. And there's a lot of the meaning for me that's related to this painting is what I would consider to be a more narrative meaning. Um, it's, it comes out of my knowing her story, my responding to her story. I got to, to this story, this painting actually came after I wrote a poem that was written in response to things in her life. So there's a lot of interweaving of things um, in this particular painting. And so you could say that there's narrative meaning also in this painting. It's not just aesthetic meaning in the painting. This painting is not only a study of discourse, it's also a narrative. And I think that there's also 
there's also ideas embedded in it. There's also ideas that, that can engage in it. If you know, uh, the way that these swirls come in, they look like the symbol of the Trinity, um, the, the interweaving ellipses. And, and I think that there's something that you could, you could use this painting to talk about theological ideas. And that would be a perfectly valid thing to do. But I think that my, my point is that your, the mode of approach is not so much a strict correlation, but the, the mode of approach, I think, to this painting first has to be aesthetic. It has to be approaching the painting as a painting. And then the, the things of the painting as an artifact in Ali's life, or as an illustration for ideas, those come as secondary, and they inform the central aesthetic meaning. And I think this is true of Lagos, Pathos, and Ethos. There's a reason why rhetoricians really hated Pathos and Ethos. Um, it's because they should only come in to support something that's already sound according to Lagos. Uh, so the other things are extraneous in a sense, right? Pathos and ethos are extraneous in a sense to philosophical discourse. But they're also, uh, as Aristotle said, they're, they're intrinsic to discourse because we are not just minds. We are not just bodies. We are not just wills. I think the, the one additional thing I might throw in for you to think a little bit more about um, as a supplement to what you said, not in, in substitution, is that, um, strictly speaking, rhetorical discourse, which is where Aristotle's threefold thing comes from, is not, I wouldn't think, in the way that you define it, philosophic discourse, right? Because, um, because what rhetoric aims to do is to produce a change in the hearing, right? Um, and so it, it's something like uh, reconfiguration, right? Or refiguration, it's something like transfer, aiming at transformation. Um, and so I think, so I think maybe another way to justify it might be to say that Aristotle's rhetoric is already thinking about discourse in a broader way than just informing. Because it's also about moving and delighting as well. And so that's why we get uh, the other two uh, modes of persuasion. So that's just another thing. Would it, would it be possible to think of these three as uh, being perhaps one has a greater emphasis that all three exist in all forms of discourse. But uh, perhaps in philosophy, the logos dominates. Because, you know, a, a good philosopher is going to be using pathos and ethos, not just sort of cerebral, abstract thinking. And also, you know, as a writer of narrative uh, that is a fi of a fictional nature, uh, I'm certainly not wanting to produce something that is overly moral in its approach. It doesn't bring in the um, aspects of, of pathos and logos. That, you know, all those elements are I think, yeah. there. But, um, so I think it's perhaps a, too of a, a rigid categorization. You need to see how perhaps one of them dominates in each one. And that, right. I, mean, I can see where you're coming from with the, with the aesthetic that the pathos may dominate, but it doesn't mean that the logos and the ethos are not important to also convey to the Right. Yeah. right. Well, and if I can respond to that by saying what Benzi again, Clement Greenberg, famous art critic in the 1950s, and he had this big thing about pure painting, and he associated with the idea of flatness, which is what I brought up of the opacity of painting, that painting is paint on canvas. And he wanted pure painting. He only wanted paint. He didn't want narrative elements. He didn't want representational elements. He just wanted pure paint on canvas. And I think his mistake was to say, I think he saw, I think he saw something similar to what I'm saying, that aesthetic discourse functions kind of in its own way. His mistake was to say, we don't want impure discourse. And the word impure obviously has negative connotations, but I think impure discourse is maybe the most powerful film, I think, stands as is maybe the most impure of all discourses. <laughs> Visually, it, it can be amazing. There's an, an, an inherent narrative element, and I think there's a really powerful philosophical element, but I think there's a reason why films are the most popular medium right now. Well, you know, I just think that, I think it's just wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Let's go back to the Van Gogh uh, painting yeah. of the, um, the shoes. Well, in the background, that is the progress. That's, that's one of the reasons he painted shoes, was because of the narrative to his progress. Right. It was so meaningful. Same thing with the sunflowers, which you know, come from a, a sermon 
that was preached that about we as Christians turn our face toward Christ like sunflowers to the sun. So there is a narrative behind that. Right? The painting stands for something uh, that is about the wrong itself. So I think my response would be that if the painting only functions as an illustration of either the narrative or the philosophical thing, then it, it does less than what paintings are capable of doing. In other words, if you're saying it merely has a didactic function, in other words, Cal gives you a painting as right. must be completely didactic with no hint of uh, perhaps the more mystical elements right. coming through of the, the idea of the irreducible transcendence that is there within a piece of art. Right. I still have another question. <laughs> Go for it. That wasn't my question. I was just following. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I don't know whether Ricoeur dialogues at all with Philip Wheelwright, who was a writer uh, back in the 1960s who dealt with the issue of metaphor. And one of the things that Wheelwright uh, acknowledged about metaphor that later Paul Tillich makes the same observation with regard to symbols. Um, Wilwright believed that metaphors die, and they are transformed from metaphors into diaphors. And Tillich believed that symbols grow and die for various reasons. This is a problem in contemporary uh, Christian portrayal of the arts, I think, because of the uh, the way that uh, sometimes we prostitute art to make it more propaganda, Christian propaganda, than true art, which always um, has a dimension of the ineffable that, uh, that is the point to it. And this is, I think, the point that both Philip and Wilrock were making about when symbols fail to point beyond themselves and to participate in that to which they point, they become idols. Right. Now, with regard to painting, um, we think about some of the truly groundbreaking painters that came on the scene and did something that was utterly unique in the whole history of painting. And then these movements sort of cluster around them. Like, it, it, I mean, um, there are a number of you know, really great Impressionist painters and other kinds of uh, painters out there. But there comes a point at which even that breakthrough that people become imitative of that breakthrough. And the imitation tends to, over time, kill the discourse because it's like it just overdoes it, overdoes it, overdoes it. It's, um, it's like too much pepper in the soup, so to speak. Yeah. Well, how, what do you think that, you know, how, how would you respond to this particular problem? Uh, because I understand what you're saying about metaphor. I understand. But how do we revitalize language uh, to, to keep it from dying this sort of death? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, Ricoeur does make a distinction. I don't, I don't know if he, I don't remember if he engaged with Ricoeur or not, but he makes a distinction between dead metaphors and live metaphors. Yeah. Even metaphor, the word metaphor, um, is a, was originally a metaphor at some point, and it became adopted into current usage and ceased to function as a metaphor and now functions in a more direct, abstract way. And, and so he does make that distinction. And that's why he says that metaphor creates resemblance. There's something new in metaphor discourse. If, if, a, if a painting or a narrative text or a poem just gives something that we already had, it doesn't tend to impact us. It doesn't tend to be terribly meaningful because we already, it didn't add something new. It didn't add any new meaning. Uh, and so this is also part of why I emphasize that artists need to pursue their medium. Um, Dr. Halla has mentioned said one time that, um, I'm trying to remember the direct, exactly what he said, but the, the, the way to be a successful artist is to um, to be yourself and to explore your medium. So I think that those are his formula. Um, and I think that, for instance, Clay has, has been producing new meaning for millennia, right? Um, and I think it will continue to do so. Um, paint is the same thing. I think that if, I think that if um, artists will, will be grounded in the tradition and continue to explore the medium. I think they will. I think they will continue to turn out new works, and they're probably going to make some works that are boring along the way. You know, you're going to write some bad short stories. You're going to write some bad poems. You're going to make some bad paintings. You're going to make some bad pots.
but it's going to, like, along the way, there will also result some, some new things. Good question. I think that, that actually may be a really good segue to what I wanted to ask you about. To say, a lot of the concerns I've had are things I've raised along the way that you've adjusted for and responded to really well in the system. I'm glad you raised the kind of Greenberg as an example because. There's a discussion toward the end of the thesis about style. Is and as you've already mentioned, this discussion here of painting, painting about painting blackness and these sorts of things. And I want to push you in this area because I think um, I think there's an undeveloped criticism that that may be helpful to sort of bring to the surface. So Greenberg's contribution here is coming from a certain view of Art's progress. And that's indebted to a Hegelian notion of history. And I wonder if, and obviously Arthur Danto's, you know, another example of Thomas of Hegelian understanding of history in aesthetics. And I'm wondering if that's an area that needs exploring, if there's any resources in the record to help with that. If that's a, if that sense of Progress is something you want to push back on. What alternative account of history would you want to offer? Is that, have I been so it's not enough that I do philosophy and aesthetics after your history. This is that, those of you who have had Dr. Holland, this is the big This is what he's all about. Uh, it's the, the Western narrative of art, and this is something that uh, Nicholas Wolterstorff talks about um, the grand modern narrative of art that we're just progressing, progressing, kind of falls flat. Um, and, and this is all the talk about the end of art, right, and starting in what, the 50s? It's um, still talking about it now. People um, talk about that too, and then... Right. Yeah. People have been talking about the end of art for a long time. So, but this notion of progress, I think, is, is an interesting one to, to be developed, and it's one that Dr. Holla's response is to turn to the Eastern solution and to explore Eastern aesthetics. Um, and there, like, there's an Eastern Native American aesthetics right now. Japanese Native American aesthetics? Class right now. And so maybe one of y'all could answer that question better than I could because I'm not in the class. But that's that's research that is called to him. So I would love to hear that research as well. And he, I think uh, Josh Bullis was, was in here, so. Yeah. Yeah, you dealt a lot with Hegel, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's maybe Josh was in there. May, it may well be that, um, that, what, that what Ricoeur's theory about semantic intuition would do for the history of art was just like what Tom Skoon's theory of um, Paradigm shifts in science to yeah. the history of science. Mm -hmm. right? Instead of one long march forward where we're getting onward and upward, right? there's these fits and starts where something new breaks on the scene that everybody then has to reckon with. Right? Right. It takes a while for everybody to figure out how to reckon with it. And then eventually that becomes the paradigm or the dead metaphor, right? right? which then needs another semantic innovation, another paradigm to shift yeah. to be able to enlighten it again. It, so there may be some formal parallels I don't know if that gets at it. Well, we've only got a few minutes left. Let's open it up for questions from the audience or comments. Yeah. Uh, Trey, you made a comment uh, when talking about the painting of the boots, and you said that uh, that painting uh, inserted meaning into those boots, and like even the act of tying the boots when going uh, to work. <clears throat> it would insert meaning to that uh, act of like tying his boots. What kind of meaning is that actually inserting that you wouldn't otherwise gather without the painting, like without um, encountering those boots through another medium as such, like seeing them in real life or encountering the person who's actually wearing them? That's a great question. What kind of meaning is inserted? Um, I'm trying to figure out how to. Maurice Brother Ponty did this work with um, the term spatiality to describe how our, what sense of our existence um, visual painting changes. So uh, this is time space is kind of how we think about physical existence, right? There's these two components. And Ricoeur argues that narrative refigures our temporality. And what Richard Carney draws out is that when we, we think of our existence as a story, 
I mean, this is what blogging is all about. This is what Facebook statuses are all about. We think of our lives as stories in progress. But the reason why we think of our lives as stories is because we've read stories. And if we didn't ever read stories, we wouldn't think of our lives as stories, right? Um, and, and the different kinds of stories we read then affect what kind of story we think our life is. Does that make sense? And so I think that paintings do the same thing, um, except for rather than our relation to time, it's our relation to space. Um, and that's a really broad thing, and this is something that I, I came across probably three months ago, two months ago, so I haven't really had time to think about it very much. Um, but when, I, when, I, when you look at a, I'm trying to think of a better example. Okay, people love Instagramming sunrise, sunsets, right? Um, and I think the reason for this is because they've seen paintings and photographs of beautiful sunrises. And, and those paintings have triggered something that makes them think, oh, this is, when they see a sunrise, they think, oh, it's like a picture. Oh, it's like a painting, right? I mean, and that, this is what we say when we look at the sky and the clouds are going crazy, but we say, oh, it looks like a painting. Think about what that means, right? That, that means that to see the sky as meaningful, we're seeing it as a painting. Does that make sense? It's, I, and this is, this is a field of research that the question you asked me is something that I'm starting to think about a lot. Um, it's something that I'm trying to figure out how to articulate, especially without getting into like crazy technical philosophical terms that may or may not actually mean anything. <laughs> Another question or two. Um, earlier on, you talked about when you're talking about texts, the text stands alone, sort of aside from the intent of the author. Can you talk about how that? way of thinking about the work applies to your visual art stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the autonomy of a painting. What this means is that one, once there's a physical artifact that's made, like once this door is here, what's significant is not what Ali was trying to do. What's significant is what she did. And, and this is actually one way of um, of maybe talking about one, one of the ways of, of evaluating art is the success of the artist in doing what they were trying to do, right? Um, you know, to talk about the ceramics, you know, like if you can't throw a certain kind of cylinder, it, it reflects on your skill as a as a potter, right? Um, and so your your ability to to make the clay do what you want it to do, um, and, and, and your craft there is a reflection of your, your skill as an artist, which isn't necessarily to say your value as an artist, because sometimes the, the, the most skilled painters technically are not the ones who see meaning the best, right? You can get meaning the best. Um, but that, that's talking about skill. So I think that that's how we would talk about the relation of the autonomy of the painting. Um, it's not, to know what she was trying to do helps inform the painting in some ways, because it informs maybe some of the narrative themes that I can also apply to it. But in terms of looking at the painting as a painting, not as an artifact in Ali's history, but as a painting. Um, I think that it's not so much significant what she was trying to do as, as what she did. And this is why workshop classes in poetry and in fiction writing are even a thing. You know, because once I print out my poem and give it to the rest of my class, I may know exactly what I was thinking, but they may all look at me and say, I have no idea what image you're trying to give me here. That means I was unsuccessful. That means I need to try again. And the same maybe with painting. That's, I think maybe that's why Sazan kept painting. Because he would get his finished work of the mountain and say, no, that wasn't it. And he, see, he still sees that thing, whatever that thing is. He keeps painting that mountain, and he, he steps back, no longer as the painter, but as a viewer. He steps back and looks at his own work and says, no, that isn't it. That still isn't it. And so he keeps trying. I think maybe that answers your question. Yeah, I think it's just one of the things that I've been gleaning from your talk was when you addressed artists and said, you know, don't focus, don't feel this immense pressure to communicate a philosophical idea. Somehow that tied to the autonomy of the work that, you know, when we approach a piece, as an artist, it's difficult, you're going to say, oh no, like, how are they going to get this philosophical idea? But what you're saying is, if they receive a sense of hope, or if they, you know, it, within that aesthetic, pathos, beautiful category, that's a way to gauge it, not necessarily whether or not a concept or right. the philosophical idea is communicated. And that's right, the right. Idea. Yeah, that's a great comment. Uh, I wonder a lot about the difference in looking at painting and then interacting with, um, say, something 3D. 
or something um, like a cup that you then experience in a different way um, because that has in my mind, and maybe this is just in my mind, like a different gauge in which you can rate like success or failure in these categories. And I don't know, I guess I haven't done a ton of thought on that, but they're, they're, they're different, you know, like, yeah. and so there's a place where, when do we talk about that? Uh, One thing that I'll say briefly is that I'm not, oh, cool. I'm not <laughs> all that interested in trying to find a standard by which to judge me. My interest in it is, is what Dan said I'll talk about as the opening space for work to be meaningful. And in what I claim about feeling of, of talking about art is gratitude, showing my gratitude. Um, and so that would be the, the first thing. But the second thing is there's a reason why I focus on painting. Is because if I tried to go to sculpture, if I tried to go to mixed media, if I tried to go to ceramics, then this would have been like what five books already, you know? <laughs> I, only had, I only had 45 pages. So I had to focus in, and it's something that I hope to keep thinking about. Like, what's unique about sculpture as opposed to painting? What's unique about film as opposed to painting or photography? You know, there's all kinds of different things, and they each do their own thing. And those of you who were here, this was my sophomore year, and went to Life in the Dark. Um, what that was all about was let's let each medium do what it does best. So let's try to figure out what each medium can do best and, and utilize it as much, utilize sounds like a terrible word. Um, let, let it do what it does best. So I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about that question, but I don't have really any answers. Well, again, let me say thank you so much for being here this afternoon and participating in this time. As you can probably guess, Trey would love to talk with you more. So if you have questions or comments or things that you're thinking about or things that he sparked in your thinking, either the ice and drink tea, your coffee, and I don't we'll sit talk with you for a long time and let you read this thesis as well. Thank you to the panel. Once more, let's commend Trey for his fine work. coffee to finish out there in the hallway.